to the Chancellor's Annual Plenary Address to the UWM Community. I am Julia Sneathan, the President Pro Tem of the Senate for this year, and I am here to introduce the plenary speaker, as well as encourage individuals involved with shared governance at UWM to attend the Faculty Senate meeting directly following the Chancellor's Plenary Address. At this time, I would ask you to join me in welcoming our speaker, Chancellor Mark Money. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Julie, for the kind introduction. Welcome, everyone. It's uh, that time of the year that's certainly my favorite. It's the, the resumption of classes, and, and it's like a new year. So happy new year. I, I love having um, the students. I love having the energy. This is absolutely uh, my favorite time, and I hope uh, yours as well. I'm going to talk today about positioning UWM for greater success. I'll use a three-part framework, as often I do, showing the structure ahead of time. I'll use this structure because these are the three main points that I want you to leave with. This campus has significant momentum, arguably some of the greatest momentum that we've had. I'll uh, show you a number of different areas where that's evident. We, like the rest of higher education across the country and probably in many international locations, are facing headwinds unlike those that we faced before. I'd like to talk about those because those are the contextual factors uh, that, that shape um, our campus and definitely our future. And then I'll end with the strategic actions that we have underway that are positioning us for greater success. And then we'll have time for questions and answers. I'll begin with our momentum. I don't think it's any surprise. Um, we've talked about most of these things before, but I do want to underscore the importance and the value of having been recertified late 2018 as an R1 university. As you know, our vision is to become top tier research university. We have achieved that. Uh, several years ago, and we have continued to maintain that. It's not by accident. It's by a lot of hard work. It's by a lot of great decision making, sound financial planning, and other things. So that's huge. We were recognized during the last year as uh, one of only two campuses in the country um, for the campus-wide undergraduate research programs that we have. So this was uh, by the Council on Undergraduate Research, uh, very prestigious. We received, in the last month, uh, positive news on our assurance argument for the uh, Higher Learning Commission. This is a big deal, as you can appreciate, because Higher Learning Commission is the most important accreditation campus-wide for UW-Milwaukee. Um, we have done a tremendous amount of work, and we now will be, as part of this over the next several academic years, pursuing programs around quality assurance for student success, namely around retention and graduation, but especially around closing the achievement gap. I'll talk more about those themes today. We are celebrating this year 50 years of Black Studies program at UWM. We're on the leading edge of this when the program began in the late 60s. And we, to help celebrate this, invited Ellen, Dr. Evelyn Higginbotham from the History Department at Harvard to come in and give uh, the address, the, the keynote address. She's an alum of UW-Milwaukee, uh, receiving her honorary doctorate from UWM in 2014. And she also um, chairs the History Department at Harvard, a very prestigious role. We're so proud of her. Can you believe it's been 10 years since the Zilber School of Public Health was opened? It's pretty remarkable. We're celebrating the 10th year anniversary, as well as in 2017, this school receiving accreditation. This year, one of the important parts of the Zilber School is that it's rolled out an undergraduate program in public health, which we anticipate a very fast uh, enrollment growth area, which will be a theme that I want to talk a lot about today. Additional areas of momentum include Governor Evers coming to the School of Freshwater Science a couple of weeks ago, and we showed him a number of different labs, different faculty engagements, different things that we're doing. He's the first governor to join the Niske for a tour, um, actually go out on the water, and, and uh, we didn't take any samples, um, but, but we stopped a couple of times, talked about a number of different activities in which we're engaged. So his visit is part of the support that we've been building for the Freshwater Collaborative, which is a UW system undertaking that UWM is leading, where we bring together curriculum development, additional research, and linkages with um, the Grand Water Challenges, the 10 uh, Grand Water Challenges. And re we've received uh, substantial support already, and we have several additional legislative visits coming up in the next couple of weeks. In May, we opened the Lubar Entrepreneurship Center, which is a game changer. It's built in a very different financial model where we have a combination of state support for the building 
and endowment support exclusively for the operations. So this is a really important breakthrough, and this is something that we have uh, campus-wide programs around entrepreneurial activities. When we spot, uh, speak about endowments and, and philanthropic activities, on Thursday last week, we celebrated one of the most significant milestones in the history of UWM. The campaign, as you've seen, I'm sure you've heard many times, we uh, were able to raise over $251 million, a quarter of a billion dollars. Our previous campaign, which ended in 2008, raised $121 million, so we more than doubled that. This is a powerful statement about the faith, the credibility of this university, and the support from you and many, many others because of the work that you've enabled us to achieve. This was done with only two people more in the development and alumni relations staff uh, compared to our previous campaign. The consultant said this could never be done. We truly punch above our weight in a number of different areas, and I think you should all be, be so proud of, of what we've what we've accomplished. Throughout the talk today, I'll talk about specific areas in which the campaign is making a difference, but I'll note very briefly right now that this campaign has supported um, a number of areas, namely, first and foremost, 53%, the lion's share or the panther share goes to student support. And this is a number of different, uh, number of different areas that I'll, I'll underscore. 35% toward research excellence and 12% toward community engagement. And the millions of dollars are substantial. We showed that night a five minute video. And I'm just going to excerpt a one minute portion of that video, kind of give you a, a few teasers, and encourage you to take a look at not only the video, but there's a longer version of this talk and many additional references for things that I'll talk about and, and additional slides that give you more uh, flavor and depth. Today I'll hit the uh, high points. Here's the, uh, here's the, the, the short. My scholarship short is helping me pursue a second master's degree and prepare for the CPA exam. I want to use this knowledge to help others and make my grandchildren proud. Without my scholarship, I might not have even gone to college. Now, I'm learning new skills on and off the field. Our donors are advancing research to protect our most important resource, fresh water. In the studio, we're coming up with ideas to revitalize Milwaukee's neighborhoods and strengthen our communities. Thanks to a generous gift, we're able to perform in this inspiring new space. What I really like about the video is how it brings to life the examples. It's not just talking heads, it's not just a narrated script, it's really um, showing the, the uh, interactions and, and the work that's actually done by virtue of the support uh, that's been provided. The neat thing about the video also is that every school and college is featured showing, um, in fact, how the, the philanthropy makes such a big difference at UWM. So the uh, next area of momentum deals with our operating and capital budget. And we're in a good situation, um, thanks to um, some, some diligence, thanks to a lot of careful planning and, and work, as well as um, the lean, uh, lean productivity that we've got. On a number of different fronts, for UW system, it's been positive, in particular for UW-Milwaukee. Overall, we've got a positive and strong operating budget and the best capital budget in the history of UWM in terms of this biennial budget. The dollars that are represented in the projects up there um, are $192 million worth, including the chemistry building, the Klotchy Annex, and then the renovations to the student union building, as well as a half a million for planning for the new engineering building, and uh, $15 million in what we call all agency funds that are gonna help us with what well, you might see them as minor projects. All you have to do is walk around the campus and see the concrete repairs, the windows, walls, and other things. This is huge. This is a result of a lot of strong, cultivated relationships, legislatively, governor, system, regents, a number of different relationships to make something like this happen. I never take this for granted, and I very, very uh, valuable, uh, I very much appreciate these, these uh, relations. It's, it's not just good luck, the wind blowing uh, the right way. So those are some of the positives with regard to when I say we have momentum. They are substantial, 
and it should make you all proud and comfortable with the position that we're in. Now, that said, we, as well as the rest of higher ed today, face what I consider to be headwinds. They're incredible, they're remarkable. And what I'm going to talk about today is only a small portion, but I think they're some of the most important themes. There's a lot of sociological, economic, um, global um, uh, trends and things that are occurring, and I'm trying to put the context in the most relevant area for the, the uh, developments that are occurring. These include, um, first, some of the aspects around enrollments. And this is a challenge that we see happening across the country. Enrollments oftentimes are described as a function of the birth dearth, or put differently, we're running out of teenagers. You've heard me say some of those same types of things before. What we um, have found this year is we've been, we've been expecting and anticipating um, some enrollment declines. And in fact, we are at um, about a 3.8% overall reduction. This, this um, results in about a $7 million um, budget impact because of this. We anticipated with some of the trends that are occur occurring, some of this. So we know that enrollment from Illinois is down. Illinois has a program called RISE, which deals with retention of Illinois students in education. And they have pumped 25 million as a starting point into student retention, and they're doing a lot more. So we figured this was going to happen at some point. They actually are getting uh, stronger budgets in terms of uh, the Illinois campuses. Our international student enrollment is down. You can appreciate um, some of the dynamics behind that. China is the number one uh, provider of st uh, international students to United States University. They're down uh, significantly. Um, we know the same is true for students from Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and other Middle Eastern locations. Transfer students, which are a large function of some of the demographic shifts, are down. Costs are up, demography is at work, strong economy, a number of these other factors, and those are just some of them. This results together, if you put the enrollment decline, along with the 30% portion of the tuition, I'm sorry, the tuition portion, which is 30% of the raises that we're getting, that's, that's uh, adding up to something that, that tells us we're gonna have to continue to lean down our expenses over the next year and beyond. The positive is that we have a new budget model that's in place that's helping guide us as we go through this. I want to point out that the College of General Studies, while it's down 10% in terms of enrollment, their FTE, or full-time equivalent, is down only 3%. So there's fewer students, but they're taking more credits. They're approaching more of a full-time status, which is a great thing for retention and ultimately graduation. I think as we look ahead, we've got a number of programs two-year to some extent, but especially four-year programs that are in the development that we have very, very uh, strong promise around. In terms of additional enrollment issues, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about the issue of completion. This is um, something that faces this region, and I'll also generalize from this. This picture has a lot going on, and it's, it's somewhat simple if I start from the top. These numbers, starting from the top, represent an average classroom, high school classroom of 20 students starting as freshmen. In the M7 region is what this is defined as, so this is very current data for this presentation. M7 is the Milwaukee 7, southeastern Wisconsin 7 counties. Today, we represent 69% of the adult working population. The college population is about 157,000 students, just in secondary, the, the 18, two and four year institutions. And then in terms of high school population, I would have to guess, but I would say it probably approximates about the same number, if not more, um, than the 157,000 students. So take an average classroom in this region. On, again, this is average. 16 of those students are going to graduate from high school. So that's the high school completion rate on average across the region. Of those, there's a melt. Only 12 of those students will continue in a two or four year education program. Of those students, in a six year period, only five of them will graduate from a two or four year academic institution. So I'm giving the two year students four years beyond and then the four year students two years beyond. So think about what that means and what that contributes to. A number of things, as you can appreciate. If we need a more educated workforce, not, you know, aside from the role of education in, in a democracy and all the important things that are critical for the role of higher ed. But if you just think about workers, from an employment perspective, you can see why there's so much of a workplace shortage, especially if we look at the rate of education 
and the correlates in our state compared to, say, Minnesota, Massachusetts, and other states where you have a higher achievement, a higher, a higher educated uh, population for a number of different economic reasons there as well. Now, where the story gets particularly grim is when you start talking about the achievement gap. I stress several times this is the average. When we look at black versus white, and when we look at Latinx versus white, the numbers really separate. Specifically, what we know in this state is that we have the largest gap of all 50 states in high school graduation rates for black versus white students. We're the 43rd state from the bottom in terms of graduation rates for Latino, Latina, Latinx versus white students. Those trends continue into college. I'm gonna share some data with you about how we are making progress, but we need to do more. And when I say we, it's not just UW-Milwaukee, but the larger, larger uh, higher ed sector. So shifting to that broader higher ed sector, again, this is a compilation of a sample of many of the trends, the, the, the contextual factors or headwinds, but it is not all of them. These are some of the leading ones. Completion rates across the country, nationally, are 60% for four-year public institutions. Think about that for a moment. That's in a six-year period. When you talk about in a four-year period, it's closer to low to mid-40s, depending on the campus. We do not achieve those rates at UW-Milwaukee. So completion rates are a knock, if you will. They're a knock because we're not getting students through at a very high level. Achievement gap, I've talked about already, that's a national phenomenon. We are doing more, but we need to do more. College debt, take a guess at what the college debt is today. Some of you might know. Any guesses? 35,000. 35,000, okay, so that's per student average debt. We're actually a little bit higher than that, but that's pretty close. The average aggre aggregate national debt today is $1.6 trillion. Some argue with that, it's 1.53, 1.55, but some say it's 1.62. I'm rounding off from three of the latest studies from this week, 1.6 trillion. There's only one debt that's higher in terms of the, the total debt load in this country, and that's your, your mortgage debt. We're higher than credit card debt, we're higher than auto loan debt, a number of other, other uh, types of debt. On average, per capita, this might stun you, the average per capita across all citizens in the United States, it would be $5,000 if you took all that debt and divided it by the population. We each would owe $5,000. Here's an interesting stat. 68% of seniors have college debt. Do you wonder why people are critical today of higher education? Think about not only the financial cost, but there's some research. There's a woman who, I think she's at NYU, she just um, is getting a lot of press this week. She's talking about the emotional burdens, the emotional costs of debt, and the, 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 the tr significant challenges that families, parents, siblings have to make about who, go, who gets to go and the sacrifices that have to be made, in addition to the housing costs, the food insecurity, all those types of things that are real. So societal views, are shaped in part by those factors, but also they include other things. The Pew Research uh, Organization last year crossed a threshold. For the first time, a majority of Americans, and different parties have had different views on this, but the majority last year crossed the threshold in agreeing with the statement, higher education is going the wrong way. In part because of the debt, in part because of what happens after college, the alignment with what is needed in terms of skill sets and workplace needs, but also the political elements, views held and views shared, those are, those are criticisms. And so it's really important to recognize this is, this is what shapes us. Those societal views become voter views, become legislative views, become regent views, and ultimately become funding issues, especially in public education. We are much more uh, exposed, if you will, to those sentiments than any other. So it's critical that we're aware of and recognize our role in shaping perceptions. And that's why we can say, yeah, but. We can talk about higher ed in the sector, but here's what we're doing. And I think you're gonna be incredibly proud of what we're doing. I've already talked about some of the things, but I'm gonna talk about more. Employer needs and demographics. Um, employer needs I've talked about a little bit already, but many of you are aware of the technological changes and the shortages, but also the changing nature of work. I chair the National Urban Serving Universities uh, group within the APLU. And we've written a paper, and we'll link this to my website if it isn't already there, 
And it's about the 21st century workforce needs. And it's about translating a lot of things that we do in higher ed into specific competencies to demonstrate value and the returns for organizations such as us that can do that are significant, but the employer needs are, are uh, very much a factor. Demographics, we've talked about uh, a little bit already. Um, they vary across the country, but uniformly, as Growey's book would show, um, Nathan Growey wrote a book that came out last year called Demographics and the Demand for Higher Ed, and it shows pretty profoundly uh, the issues that are going on, underscoring, for example, in Wisconsin. We have fewer high school students today than we had in 2010, but we're gonna go off an even more significant cliff in another five or six years. So, this is summarized and captured in a headline that came out last week on the left-hand side, the Chronicle of Higher Education, cover story on Monday, last week, um, said the great enrollment crash. Students aren't showing up, and it's only gonna get worse. Leading to this type of report, CBS News also, at the same time, saying experts predict 25% of colleges will fail in the next 20 years. Now this is nothing new. This is something we've been seeing. Um, uh, uh, Clay uh, Christensen at Harvard talked over a decade ago about higher ed because of the resistance to change and inability to adapt to the environment is probably you know, on, a, on, a, on a short list for, for um, you know, kind of in the bullseye. I think in contrast to some of these predictions, we're gonna show how nimble and how agile we are in terms of a lot of the changes that are underway. But these are out there. And these trends are undeniable in terms of some of the, the issues that are, that are happening. And we've seen this in the news, we've seen this, uh, if you look across the University of Wisconsin system, you'll see most campuses will have enrollment declines. Some uh, are a little bit uh, different in terms of the demand, such as Madison. Uh, but um, these trends have led to a couple of provocative perspectives. Some of you have seen these before, if you've been involved with some of the governance groups and some of the leadership uh, retreats and things that, that we've been talking about for the last year. Some people would argue that higher ed is or has missed the mark. You know, it's that critical kind of cynical view. And the question for all of us to consider is, so our environment is changing. Our environment has changed. Some would argue it changed a long time ago. The financials, the economic models of higher ed, they're broken, we hear that a lot. So what are we doing? Have we changed enough? Those are provocations that really underscore the need for us to change, for us to think about some of the success that we have and how do we build on that? How do we look at things more self-critically and how do we seize those opportunities for additional growth? They certainly, those types of questions bring us to, to this point. We're at a crossroads. The decisions that we make today will set our course for 2025, 2030 and beyond just like what we decided or didn't decide because of certain commitments that were made five, 10, 15 years ago put us on a course that we are today. And we've had great luck. We've made some really strong, smart decisions. So I wanna underscore the momentum, the positives here about despite some of these headwinds, the progress and the pace at which we're going. We're doing a tremendous amount. I think nobody would argue with this statement how much we're doing with few resources. The example that I gave from development and alumni relations is but one. Every school and college, every administrative unit, when we look at how lean we are relative to other campuses, how far we go, how many turns we get out of a dollar, if you will. So we're among the most under-resourced R1s in the country, objectively true. We can talk about the size of the faculty. We can talk about our pay level relative to others. We can talk about the resources that we get. It again underscores how good we are. And I want to repeat that, how good we are. We're incredible. It is challenging, though, to sustain this in light of our dual mission, the access and research, which I think are synergistic. I think they're powerful together. But it does raise incredible challenges to, to continue that. So what are we doing about these things? What's underway? What's our momentum going to look like as we continue down this path? And at the same time, what yet needs to be done? The strategic actions, I think you can appreciate, most importantly, revolve around enrollment. I'm gonna cover five areas. I'm gonna spend most of my time on enrollment. You won't believe how fast I'll go through items two through five. Knowing me, you won't believe. You won't believe how fast I'll go through those, but I am gonna dive into uh, item one um, deliberately because this is the most important. There was a, um, a, a president of a, 
of a campus recently. He made a comment. It wasn't this one, but I've kind of converted it. And his, his statement was, um, as important as our mission is, important as everything we do in terms of our values, if there isn't admission, there isn't a mission. <laughs> and I think it really captures the idea of the importance of enrollment. So I want to talk about enrollment in the three-part framework. I'll talk about recruitment. That's the funnel. That's the gate. That's, that's where it all starts. But then we have to talk about retention and all of our role in that. And then graduation, which is the, the, the prize, if you will. That's, that's, that's the ultimate goal. So we'll break these down, and I'll deliberately go into each one of them a little bit, starting with recruitment and what we're doing and what we're going to be doing more of in the future. We have a new welcome center that is part of the Lubar Entrepreneurship Center. If you haven't been in there, I encourage you to go. It's a remarkable facility. It's first class. It really helps put us on the map. It's the front door. We have 20,000 visitors a year. That's students, prospective students, parents, family members, friends. We have the open house or open, open uh, campus sessions called Go Milwaukee. We've seen a 20%, almost a 20% increase in students from those events. The challenge, of course, is opening that funnel up and getting more students into to those types of activities. We've spent much more time, and I've been reviewing, many people have been reviewing focus groups. How are decisions made? At what point are they made? How are we best able to use our social media? How are we best able to position ourselves to showcase what you do and then put that in the light that's most aligned with what our students are saying, this is what's important? Um, for them to, to make the choice about UWM. Seamless transfers is an important concept, and you have a role in that. We can talk about articulation agreements. We can talk about how family members tell me all the time. My son went two years at WCTC, and then he wanted to go on to a four-year education. He wanted to be a police officer. He wanted to be an engineer. He wanted to be this or that, and he ran into a problem when he went to transfer. And then you work through the mechanics of that, and that's where we have to look at our own articulation agreements, and ultimately when we think about faculty and staff, looking at smoothing out these issues, that's really important. We've done better. We're working on improving even further. The two-year campuses are critical. As you probably know, MATC has been historically our largest source of transfer students. They still are, but we could do so much more if we can figure this out even better. So it's a huge opportunity, um, and we've got a number of uh, academic units that are working on, that, on this, and there's a special meeting coming up to uh, further develop that. We have some very successful partnerships when we think about pipelines that are so vitally important. M cubed is one of the leading ones. M cubed, if you don't know, stands for Milwaukee Public Schools, MATC, and UWM working together to change the academic and educational achievement of individuals in Milwaukee. We represent about 130,000 students. We're the largest publics of our kind serving um, any, any region to, to, in terms of the Wisconsin students. We have helped Milwaukee Public Schools achieve something that you have to go back many, many years to find an outcome like this, a graduation rate that is about 67%. When we began, the uh, graduation rate was in the high 50s. We need to continue that, and our two-year projection from now is actually 72% graduation. This is important, but it's not just the binary graduate, did not graduate. It's the qualitative aspects of are they better ready for college. One of the most notable programs that we've put together is called the Early College Program. I'd like to share just a little bit about this, and we'll put the video up for this that's just being developed right now. I just reviewed the, the last, what I think is the last version of this two days ago. Early college program is premised where we did a pilot this spring, where UWM and MATC delivered 10 credits for high school seniors. It was one semester. The students came to both campuses. We provided the transportation, meals, and support. Didn't cost the students a thing. 32 started, 32 finished. Many of those students gained confidence. They gained skills. They gained credits. And what was so powerful about this is hearing the students, we had six or seven of them at graduation speak, and they talked about, there was one great, great story where a, a, a gal came up, and she said, chewing her gum, all tattooed, all ringed up, she said, she said I, knew, I knew this was going to be just as easy as high school. I knew it was just going to be you know, a breeze. I've never been challenged. She said, it hit me right between the eyes on the first day. I realize how serious this is. 
and she just had these big eyes. It was incredible. Meanwhile, on the other side, there were most of the students who were very intimidated, and they talked about how this gave them confidence. But the most poignant example was a student who said this, I never thought I'd make it to college, graduate, or even live this long. He's 18 years old. The world in which he lives is so different than the world from which most of us live. And it was remarkable to have that type of perspective and to have the life-changing experience and the parents and the family members talk about how this has changed their kids' lives. And now they can go to college with confidence and credit. Now think about as we expand this program this year, doubling the students, doubling the credits. So these students will have 19 credits for free, which gives them more than a semester's worth. It's a huge head start. But again, it comes back to that self-efficacy. I can do this. And where they want to go with the majority of these students never having been on a college campus before. So this is the early college program. The second bucket is retention. As important as all the pipeline is, what do you think the percentage is of recruitment in terms of new students, freshmen, that come to this campus relative to our larger campus? If you had to take a guess, what would it be? If you don't think through this, some people think, oh, it's a third or 40 percent. In fact, it's hardly 15 percent. The majority of our students are returning students. This is where we can have the most impact. And who has the impact and what determines whether students come back? It's in this room. It's those of you who are watching. It's what happens in the classroom. It's what happens in the labs. It's what happens in terms of those hallway interactions that determine the quality of the experience. And then the stories they tell. The stories they tell as they're the big sisters and the big brothers, and they have their siblings who follow them or their friends that are still in high school. That's the, that's the if you will, the magic. That's, that's the, it's the vibe. It's what, it's what we do. So this is where we can have clearly the biggest impact. And I want to show you, I mentioned earlier about the achievement gap, something that's really important about what we're doing at UWM today. We know through a series of interventions, oftentimes known as high impact practices, what we can do to help influence the retention of our students. And I want to share with you just a really, really neat uh, development that we've been working on, not just this year, but we've been implementing and putting in place for some time. If you look at um, the first year retention rates, which by the way is the most critical year, in fact, the first semester, and second semester are the most important. If students come back after those, they're much more likely to continue. Second to third year is always higher, third to fourth year even much higher. So this is the biggest fall off is first to second year. So as we look at this, look over here, if we have no interventions, none of these types of activities, supplemental instruction, peer mentoring, and so on. If you have no intervention across all your freshmen, you hardly get half of them. It's, it's just a little bit more than half. Think about that for a moment, how hard it is to recruit the retention, there's a tremendous fall off. Now, what we know, former uh, uh, Dean uh, Richard Meadows did a study um, in his last year or two here, and he looked at what happens to those students. And what he found was about half of them go on to other colleges, and about half of them never go anywhere at all. We think, oh, they might go to a MATC, or they might go, they just don't continue at all. Debt issues and employment opportunities, it's fascinating what happens. But with intervention, look at the gold column across all freshmen, 75%, and then look at both the non-underrepresented minority and underrepresented minority, and what you see is profound. Less than a percent difference. The point being, this helps all students. These interventions help all students and close that achievement gap. Hugely powerful, and this is what we can do. Now, we need to keep this going, second to third year, third to fourth year, and we can effectively close that achievement gap, which, by the way, for graduation, we have been bringing down every year. But it doesn't move quickly. This is the result of, of a lot of success. So this is retention and the types of things that, again, what you can do, advisors, faculty, staff, all the way around, we all have roles in this. Speaking of faculty, EAB, Educational Advisory Board, had something that just came out a couple of weeks ago in September, earlier this month. Faculty members are key to solving the retention challenge, underscoring what I've been saying. That's the important relationship. Despite all the other activities that happen, it really comes down to that as the center. And you know that. If you spend time in the classroom, academic instructional staff or faculty, that's 
the true uh, element of interaction, the way we engage in research, the types of experiences that we provide for our student, the incredible excellence we have in the classroom. So it's about your innovations that make such an important difference. And I want to share some examples to, to really illustrate your role and what some of our areas are, are doing. You may or may not know that we are the leading campus in the state of Wisconsin in terms of online learners. We have more students online than any other campus. We may not be there for long. And I don't know how we fare compared to the outstate, you know, the Arizona States and the Purdue Globals and others in terms of the total number of students who are attending from Wisconsin. But I do know that of the brick and mortar campuses in Wisconsin, we're number one. That may not last the investments that are being made and the changes that I understand are occurring. In our School of Information Studies, the largest master's program, which was not at all the largest master's program before it went online, is today uh, continuing to grow, and they have an undergraduate in IST that's continuing to grow fairly significantly and substantially because they figured out not just the online but the in-person portion around the advising and removing barriers, putting students first, and really getting involved where there's early warnings and a lot of things that, that occur. We've seen in the Honors College a number of remarkable outcomes. We had 97 graduates last year, which is a record. They have increased their enrollment from 2015 to today by 17% over the last four years. They are at uh, almost 700 students, but importantly, their retention has gone from four years ago, 65% to 81%. How? Curriculum reform, faculty engagement, the type of work, and you know the Honors College is intensive with faculty involvement. It's holistic uh, admission, invasive advising. It's about engagement, and I'm going to come back to that when I wrap up. Honors College growth, great role model. Flex degrees meeting needs. We have today 880 students in flex degree programs. We've graduated almost 300. As the name implies, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of when you take the course, your pace, and then ultimately um, what you need because of prior learning assessments. A couple of students illustrate this. I'll just give a few comments uh, from them. On the left-hand side, you have a student in biological sciences or biomedical sciences. She's doing diagnostic imaging. Uh, Christy says, it's the flexible it's that flexible option, which, which, is, which is awesome uh, for people like me who don't have time for a traditional college degree. That underscores the, 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 the point of flex. On the right-hand side is a nursing student. And what Ken says is that this is not only important for me, but it's changing the profession. And if you think about this in terms of the impact and the knowledge that we share and disseminate through our research and education, this is what UWM is all about. So the flex degree is an innovative program that expands dramatically our reach. I go to alumni events around the country, and I increasingly see students across the six majors that are at these alumni events that feel an association. They feel the quality attachment to UWM because of their online experiences. That's a hard and high bar to reach, but we've done it. So great job. The final piece in the three buckets is around graduation. Graduation is the end game. When I talk to parents, students, and others, we talk about student success. What is student success? And you can think of a number of different things. But ultimately, the number one ingredient is always, it's graduation. We've got to get through. What are we doing? We've expanded scholarships in a substantial way. I mentioned the campaign earlier. From this campaign, with $37 million dedicated specifically to student scholarships, we have a 24% increase in the dollars that are from the foundation. We have 45% increase in the number of scholarships. This is just over the last four years. The great thing about this campaign is the endowment growth will continue to grow, we'll have more scholarships, and all the gifts aren't in. In other words, that was $251 million pledged, but all those dollars are not in yet, and we're already able to see this type of increase. So this is truly one of the transformative effects for helping with graduation, getting students through. Is it enough? No. We have input uh, more campus funds than ever before for student scholarships because you can imagine the return. In other words, the investment of a few thousand dollars, if it brings much more tuition and much more enrollment, 
you know, so we're always working on the math of that. And we're having a very specific strategy I'll talk about later for that. Simplifying paths and reducing costs. I've talked about that a little bit already in terms of the barriers, transition, articulation agreements, seamless paths, getting more students in the pipeline. But academic maps that especially faculty and advisors are important for is, is a critical uh, skill. And then this concept called 15 to finish. We know that if you don't take 15 credits per semester, you're not gonna get through in four years unless you have time for winterum or summer classes. We know that's difficult to do, and of course there's the online option today as well. But UW-Milwaukee occupies one of the top positions in a place we don't wanna be top. Our students graduate with 143 credit hours on average. It takes on average, most of our programs are about 120. Think about that for a moment. Our students are graduating with 23 extra credits that they're paying for and taking time. Why? Part of it is the student population that we serve. I mentioned earlier, transfer students. Transfer students sometimes come in with more courses. They, they switch majors and they have more courses that don't fit. Can we help with that? Huge opportunity. I cannot begin to tell you how many students do not come to UWM because of the fact that we don't take their credits. But guess what? They are going to other accredited universities. So that's a huge area for us to potentially enroll many more students. But the 15 to finish is a mindset. And it is hard for our students. My son, who graduated from UWM, took 12 credits most of the time because he was working 30 to 35 hours a week. I get it. I understand part-time, it's difficult. We need to have more students that get on that 15 credit path. And enhancing the experiential learning, which we're doing much more of, and we need to build that in, because that really shows the relevance of the skills you're learning in academe to what you're doing. And I don't care what the field is, it's hugely important for retention. We know this is just as important as, as some of the research activities. So graduation is illustrated so well by Traquan Martin. I'd love you to hear his story. I was the first male in my immediate family to walk across the high school graduation stage. I had a $100,000 scholarship to go to Morehouse at a 2.97 when we were supposed to maintain a 3.0. I had lost $35,000 that was left on my scholarship when I returned home to come to UW-Milwaukee. I work as a site coordinator advisor for Milwaukee Public Schools College and Career Centers, working with students on college essays, scholarships. I get this master's degree, not bragging rights for me. I feel like it's bragging rights for the community, and that's why I do it, working in education, to change lives, to impact students, to be a role model. I think it's just surreal. I can't wait to uh, just walk across that stage and be able to take the degree back to my mom, my brother, my daughter, just to be able to show everyone else it's possible. I did it, you can do it. I feel like losing a scholarship was the best thing that happened to me. Coming to UW Milwaukee made me grow faster. It helped me learn more, helped me to get a bachelor's degree, and now a master's degree. Are we proud of that story? Isn't that incredible? Yeah, go Traquan, that is really neat. He did graduate in May, and uh, we're just delighted to call him a proud panther. Um, but that's the power of what we do, it's what graduation is about. Now, for the fast ones. Okay, I told you I was gonna spend a lot of time on enrollment, and I hope you can appreciate why. Uh, research excellence, I think to some extent, we have got that in hand because of the recertification of R1, but the bar continues to grow. It gets higher, the mountain is tougher to climb. We are doing these things right now, and we'll continue to do more. We have um, uh, been working with schools and colleges specifically on their plans, focusing around the resource allocation, the hiring patterns, looking at what's known as either interdisciplinary or cluster research because of the importance of grants today across uh, discipline, implementing a workload policy to elevate the importance of research and protect the time for those who are productive, the partnerships to get funded research through the industry types of activities that I'll talk about more in a moment, and recruiting further diverse students. We know the dimensions that are required for R1. We know the value and the importance of R1, and so that is really what our budget model and other activities are built around. The third piece that is underway is a, a development and continued planning for the community engagement and talent pipeline. And what this stresses specifically is building on the Carnegie classification that we received four years ago 
and to add more work experiences, service learning to different parts of the curriculum, and have new curricular offerings that align with some of the needs of our students, the needs of the region, and employers. The growth in external strategic partnerships, and I underscore the partnership, has been significant over the last five years. We today have um, a number of, of centers and institutes from data science, which will be campus-wide, to connected systems that is starting really in three schools, Lubar Entrepreneurship Center, Higher Education Regional Alliance, most all of these I've talked about, so I won't go into detail. But the last two I haven't talked a lot about, so I'm gonna just spend a moment. DESK is a big, a big potential game changer for the campus, and what it stands for is the Design, Design Solution Center. We're working on the name. It gets us to desk, which may be kind of antiquated in the world today, um, but the concept here, the premise of it, is online non-credit programs around credentials, stackable certificates that lead to degree programs that lead to a lot of other educational opportunities, but it's a, a, a foot in the door, especially to adults in the, in the workplace, where there's untapped potential, but what we know is most employees today, at least half it's estimated, need a complete upskilling, need a complete re-education re, uh, in a number of different ways. This is the path to that, as well as opening the door to a lot of other online learning opportunities. Panther Foundations for Success is where we have today. It usually varies, but it's as many as eight to 12 different organizations, such as the leading area firms, Harley-Davidson, Briggs & Stratton, Rockwell, Johnson Controls, and they help, they're looking for diverse talent and they help bridge the, the academic skills with workplace skills. So they do a lot of mentoring, they do a lot of work with our students. I'd like to share with you a quick story of a student who started at what was then UW-Waukesha, today UWM-Waukesha, and her journey through this program. I figured that going to UW-Waukesha was a good option for me because I would be able to live at home. My parents have been a really big support system for me in making decisions for my future. My dad graduated from UW-Milwaukee and it's part of the reason why I chose to go to UW-Milwaukee myself because he had a great time and he's very successful. After UW-Waukesha, I transferred to UW-Milwaukee and I declared finance as my major. The Panther Foundations for Success is an internship development program that equips undergraduate students with the skills and capabilities to have a seamless transition within the corporate workplace. When I joined PFS, I had interviews from Harley Davidson and Rockwell Automation, and I picked Rockwell Automation to fulfill my internship for the summer of 2018. At Rockwell Automation, I was able to complete a global margin analysis. In addition, I was able to travel to Monterey, Mexico to complete an inventory audit. What I like the most about UWM is the support system I have here. Victoria Pryor has been a very big support system in my life. Not only is Victoria the director of PFS, but she also is in charge of the BCC, which stands for the Black Cultural Center. And it's been a phenomenal experience to get to work with her. Well, thank you, Ashley, and thank you, Brentel, Pa for showing her the way to UWM. It's really a neat story. We're just extremely proud of, of what she has accomplished. The last area is, I'm sorry, the fourth to the last, uh, the, the second to the last area is around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Before I talk about the details here, I wanna just underscore the importance of elevating this to a strategic direction. This is about our culture, this is about our climate, and there's a number of activities that have been underway and some that are new. These are aimed at really um, taking care of our people and recognizing the value, the role, and the importance of a number of different outcomes. The DEI framework has been established, and we are launching now the faculty portion of this. There's three different groups. And the faculty work group is looking at issues around the representation, the diversity, the numbers that we have, and how do we increase the opportunities, how do we employ more diverse talent, how do we retain, and how do we develop individuals. And diversity can be on any dimension imaginable. So this is important, and in the spring, we'll be uh, rolling out the staff and the student groups um, for this. And we also have a steering committee that reports to me for the DEI framework. We have integrated the multicultural centers, some of which you just heard about with Ashley's video. We have integrated all our multicultural centers with common goals, common metrics, and a common type of support. 
as opposed to four and five years ago where the centers reported to a number of different homes, three different places on campus. We brought more alignment, clear lines of supervision, and uh, better support for our students that help them with sociocultural, academic, and other types of support. The Care, Respect, and Expression Task Force was launched early in the summer and with the faculty and staff back. We've got four work groups that have been working underway. They're developing a set of recommendations through these groups around education, research, communication, and those recommendations will be forwarded by the end of October and ultimately finalized later this semester. We're not waiting for those recommendations, though. We have two uh, sessions planned around freedom of expression offerings this fall, at least one more in the spring. We expect these to be integrated. We expect these to be educational, informative, much like when we've done these types of activities in the past. They're critical. The fifth area is the sustainability for our campus. No surprise, CMAT's work is critical. CMAT is the Chancellor's Enrollment Management Action Team. That's the group that is charged with all those recruitment activities, retention, and graduation that I talked about earlier. CMAT has representation from our schools and colleges as well as our central administrative units. It's critical that we get this right. Fiscal actions, no surprises here, I mentioned earlier. Focusing on institutionally provided, that's, that's what we support for financial aid. That's not the outside philanthropic, it's not grants, it's not external, it's what we allocate. The new budget model implementation of which we're in the second year. And then our integrated support services, the hubs. We're rolling out the second one in the spring. And this is a way to have more efficiency around uh, HR, procurement, financial aid, and the, the uh, help me out here. IT, IT thank you. <laughs> I always drop one. Practice today, I got them all, but I always drop one. So this is, this is a mark for efficiency and standardization. We also will continue with our capital planning, and I think you can all appreciate capital planning isn't just for the 21-23, it's 20, it, we actually are out at least five biennial budgets in terms of the mock-up of how we're looking at a lot of the, the needs on our campus. Branding visibility and image is going to be undertaking something that I think is critically needed. I think you'd all agree with me that we've risen in a lot of different national and international standings. We joined the Shanghai Research Index again last year. We have moved up in a number of different indicators. Go to the Princeton Review of Best Colleges, a number of different things. But locally and in the region, the larger Midwest, UWM does not get its due. And I see this, and you see this, and it's befuddling, and it's perplexing, and it's disappointing. We are going to be undertaking a more significant rebranding that talks about UWM first. UWM is a choice institution, really looking at a number of things that you do and showcasing excellence and really putting uh, a great flashlight, a great lens on that. You may know that today 73% of our incoming freshmen said UWM is their first choice. That number has gone up every year since we've been measuring it for the last four years. And think about when the world becomes where 95 to 100% of our students say UWM was their first choice. And by the way, we are in the top three choices for 98, where 98% of the students put us in their top three. We want to be the top choice, and we want to be in a situation where we have so many students, we don't know what to do with them. We'll figure that out, by the way. So as far as the wrap-up here, this picture is a picture of the class of 2023, taken a couple of weeks ago when we had the fall welcome. We're here for them. These students are energetic. These students are bright, hardworking. They're remarkable. Several of you joined me when we spent time that afternoon with them with our, um, our, our, our uh, campus read, where we had students read um, much around the, the different voices and views on what it means to be an American, written by Taryn Powell at WWM. But these students, while, they're, while, while we're here for them, they're here because of you. And this is a reciprocity that I want to stress. This reciprocity is the powerful part of UWM. It's a symbiosis that's, that's uh, absolutely remarkable. And it speaks to what we all have to do, given this responsibility for transforming the lives of these, these amazing students. How we engage with them, how we make a difference in their life is critical. And what we don't know in education is the ultimate impact. Many of us are very fortunate because we see that years later. We see that as alumni, 
We see that when we interact with students in the employment or in the academic or lives of, of, of students that are pursued. But I want to underscore, when we talk about the recruitment, the retention, and graduation, that everything you do has an impact. I want to share with you a quick story that um, came to mind this summer. Um, and it deals with, with the parents' experience that I wouldn't have otherwise seen how some of this stuff plays out. Um, so, dear Mark, two years ago, I waited in a car in line at Cambridge Hall to drop off my son for freshman year at UWM. He was already inside the building, so I was alone in my car waiting for my turn to enter the garage. The feelings of the moment were getting to me, and tears were welling up in my eyes as you walked from car to car, greeting all the families lined up, at that, lined up that day. You sensed my struggle and tried to make happy conversation with me through my car window. Have I ever been accused of that before? Um, you you uh, put me immediately at ease as I told you my story and how excited we were to have my son entering the next chapter of his life at UWM. As I told you about him, you told me you could tell that he was going to do great things at UWM. Thank you for your kind words of support and reassurance. He has done well. As you may know, he was just voted to be your UWM sophomore rising star. My daughter now also attends UWM as a freshman following in her brother's footsteps. She was accepted to UW-Madison, but chose UWM instead. She is loving life and also doing very well academically and socially at UWM. We just don't know. We just don't know the impact that we have, but it comes back. Apologize about the trite metaphor, but it truly, what we do is that pebble in the calm pond, and it's the ripples that go out, and they actually become like a tsunami in terms of the lives, the families, the communities, and ultimately the world that we impact. But it's in that context that I underscore how we are all brand ambassadors, every single one of us, not just in the classroom, not just in the advising, not just in financial aid, not just in terms of cleaning the buildings, not just in those capacities, but when we're interacting with our family, our friends, our neighbors, we wear the UWM colors. And speaking of which, I have never seen more UWM black and gold on campus than I have this fall. It's really neat to see our students with that pride. But we, they reflect us. And so I ask you, I implore you to help me removing all the barriers that our students have, helping support them as we have done so well, and finding ways to do even more. Because as good as we are, we need to be even better given the headwinds that we face. The campus is needed. This community needs UWM more than ever. I see the price points of private institutions. I know what value we offer for significantly less. There's nothing like UWM. I can't stress how essential you are to this mission. So thank you for that. And I want to end on three quick notes, what I said at the beginning. Never forget the momentum that we have. We're in a great position. UWM is well regarded. The campaign speaks volumes to that. Never before have we had this type of success. Every single academic institution, well, maybe not the Stanfords, maybe not the Harvards, they have a little different situation in terms of the endowment and things. But all of higher ed, except those, <laughs> face huge issues. They're around the, the, the challenges. It's not just the demographic enrollments. It's around financials. It's around societal issues, value of degrees, all of that. But it's with our plans. It's with our actions that we have underway, and especially with you, our leadership, our faculty, staff, the community, the importance of our students. You give us that competitive advantage to continue to succeed now and well into the future. So thank you for all you do. Thanks for being here today. I'm happy to address any questions that you have. Yes, Mark. The question that I have is, it seems oftentimes that outside of this campus, it is a distraction, an irrelevancy, even an embarrassment, say, at system, 
Do you think that any of the people who have resources are care enough about it to actually give us more resources to help us do that? I, I, um, I think you all heard the question. I absolutely do. I have never heard more support from the regents, the recognition of the importance of R1. I've also never heard more individuals when I think about the campaign that gave, uh, Pat, correct me if I'm wrong, $89 million of the 251 for research. The number of endowed professorships, the number of, of what we've been able to do in terms of the number of faculty and staff that are on research support as a result of the campaign. So those types of resources, check. Absolutely growth in that, more significant than ever. As far as the base budget, and I think really the core that you're getting at, is will we get the allocation? And I am telling you, I'm meeting with regions specifically, not just the Milwaukee area regions. What's powerful about the way the regions are aligned right now is that we have six of the 18 that are from Milwaukee. So I'm working very focused, very deliberately on exactly this issue as well as system in terms of the apportionment of the UW system. This is an uphill battle, and we have achieved greater percentages than we ever have vis-a-vis -vis other campuses. UWM West, notably, um, but we need to do more, and that's, that's a huge issue. I hope as we go forward that as we look at additional criteria down the road in terms of, of where the system is going, because the issues that I talk about at UWM for transformation that's needed, the system also has to be thinking about those in significantly different ways, and how UWM can help the state is by having more elevation for our research mission. We are the talent pipeline. Go to any major employer and many small and medium ones and ask them where they get the majority of their talent. UWM almost always, almost always is there. We have that check, but it's the research partnerships, it's the research contributions that are increasingly recognized. So I, I think we're on a good trajectory, but we need, we need even more forceful uh, direction on that, and I'm trying to provide that. So, yeah. Yes, Lane. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Mark. Um, so, the, you know, this, this strikes me. I, I teach literature and sometimes science fiction. It's called speculative fiction, and it's all about world making. And this strikes me that we're engaged in a kind of world making exercise. Um, and part of, part of the power of world making is who frames the, 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 the kind of dynamics that go into it. We there's a lot of interesting contradictions with this. So on one hand, we have this super positive uh, uh, sense of community support in terms of the, the, the fundraising. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, uh, we have this kind of constant um, sense that uh, with these polls that, oh, you know, higher education, you're on the wrong track, the public doesn't trust you, the, you know, there's this sort of, this sense of kind of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, you know, liberal detachment from the realities of the, of the kind of hard grind of, of, of contemporary life. Um, I'm, I'm interested in those contradictions and I'm interested in who makes those frames because when we listen to that frame and when we repeat that frame, uh, not only do we strengthen that, and, and, and we, we kind of, in, in a sense, sort of can paralyze ourselves and our own power. But it's also clear that we're not looking at other potential frame makers. So I also think in terms of our student generation, uh, uh, young people in their 20s coming in, the ones you so uh, eloquently um, showed uh, that, we, that we affect, um, they're the most liberal generation we've had in a long time. They're the most concerned about issues of climate change. You know, join them tomorrow for the climate march downtown. They'll be there. Uh, they're the most uh, interested in, in uh, social inclusion and, and tolerance. Uh, they're the very group that these other frame makers are, are like super concerned about. So, I'm a little bit torn, like which frame do we listen to? I know which, which ones I choose to listen to, but which do we institutionally listen to? Because it seems to me if we really want to have a kind of power, we, we listen and create the frame of the, of the very people, those, those, the, the generation coming up that, that, that were uh, you know, actually like living with and living for. Just some 
thoughts? They're great thoughts. Um, and if I can just reflect for a moment, what I think you're sharing is, is the incredible paradox, the contradictions that exist, um, not just in my role, but for all of us, the different constituents that we have in public education. I really like what you're stressing and saying, which is um, the student voice and making sure that we reflect as we frame issues around that. Um, I've been meeting with the Student Association um, this semester and with our student affairs folks um, to really be dialed into that more through the different fora that they have and to really talk about the issues that are of central importance to them and then how we align and how we build more support for the needs that they have. Um, and I'd encourage you to, to help us think about that. And I, I also agree, Lane, with, with the idea that, and, and what I tried to achieve in this message, um, again, tried, is, is, is the importance of, of the trajectory and, the, and, and not dwell on the headwinds and, and the negativity and the cynicism that's out there because it's all too oppressive. And if you're around, whether it's talk radio or other things, it's, it's, it's difficult. But to really reflect and, and also to think about um, the framing because of the importance of that in the context of people wanting to be associated, whether it's enrollment or philanthropic, or politically, or otherwise, with, with where the momentum and the impact that's positive is. Um, and by the way, I think it's evident to us all, we're not perfect, we have much room for improvement, and certainly along the way, the, the, the importance of that. But if I dwell on that or go too far down that, especially in a context that, that's public, which I oftentimes find myself in, it's, it's harder, I think, for us overall um, but the work that we have to do in terms of policy, curriculum, true engagement in the community, I think that's where we can really grapple with a lot of those tougher issues. But I agree. I, I, I like your thought. I'd like to continue the conversation, too. Thank you. Yeah. Our timekeeper, the parliamentarian, is saying, saying that we're well over our time, as does our secretary of the university. If there are any burning issues, I don't see any, but, but please feel free to, to engage and, and, and send me questions. Happy to, to continue this. Thank you all again for, for being here today.